All right. Uh, I've got to apologize for my rusty voice a bit. I um, might have had one or two beers too many last night, and it's definitely not my hour. But apparently, uh, I don't know, I'm pretty surprised that so many people showed up at 9 a.m. So good morning. This is why you say good morning back. Good morning. Good morning. Perfect. Works every time. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Christopher Heel. I'm a lead application architect at Atomic. But since nobody really knows what that actually means, myself included, everybody just knows me as the continuous delivery guy. As uh, continuous delivery and continuous integration is the, are the topics that I spent most of my time with the last one and a half years or so at the company. Basically, the story that I want to tell you now for the next 20, 25 minutes or so. So to give you some context, um, the company I work with, Atomic, we are an independent software vendor. We produce like automation software for business process automation, basically a fancy term for we have some stuff where we execute your processes on your systems. And we have three main products. Um, we run on a lot of different platforms, a lot of uh, mainframes as well. And we have about 2,700 uh, customers, which might not sound that many, but all of those customers are actually pretty big businesses that run all of their business critical um, stuff with our software. And they run up to like 140 million tasks every month uh, through our system on up to 100,000 different servers. This is per customer and actually counting. And what all of these customers have in common, especially the ones in the financial sector, is they're uh, pretty resident, uh, hesitant to change or upgrade any systems. Um, they have super fine and grain in their brains. There's never change running system as it always worked. And ideally, they want to just set it up once and don't touch it for the next 50 years. So uh, that's a bit of a pain. So we have a pretty slow upgrade behavior and, um, of course, a fixed release cycle. Uh, at the moment, we release every nine months a new major version. And we still have to support the last three um, releases and maintain the last three releases, which is, as a developer, not really the ideal situation. Ideally, you want to have everyone on the latest version, which is at the end of every sprint, and you don't want to maintain any old code. And ideally, you also want to actually run your software yourself. And in our case, all the software is actually running on the premises at our customer side. Um, so this is a bit tricky. And um, uh, probably two years ago, we decided we want to push um, everyone in a bit of a different direction and go towards the direction of continuous delivery. I'm going to make a bold assumption and just assume that everyone knows the gist of continuous delivery and why everyone should strive to do that and why it gives you better quality, both technically and feature-wise, and why it gives you better risk management and so on, and focus more on the how or what we did to get there in our context, basically, with this business uh, enterprise um, application. So about two years ago, we said we want to go into the direction of continuous delivery spent um, quite a lot of effort and time into transitioning to HL methodologies. As a lot of other companies, we came from Waterfall and all the cool stuff that never, no one misses anymore. Um, and we managed to get to a certain, well, pretty high degree to cross-functional teams, feature teams, um, with HL methodologies, maybe Scrum, Kanban, whatever the team chooses, for around 170 people in the engineering department in six locations, three different continents, but we're all working on the same product, which is a bit challenging because, um, yeah, 170 people, 170 possibilities to do something wrong. But also not because we have so many different people in different time zones um, working on everything the same, at the same time, but also because of the application that we have. We have a lot of different technical components, and the components tend to grow in size uh, and number pretty quickly. Um, either you buy new um, other companies, integrate their software, um, or you just add new features. For example, last version, we added some analytics features, and that's suddenly added three more components because it, it needs another backend, another frontend, a data store. So you end up with a lot of different components with a lot of different technologies. We have everything from .NET, Java, to C, and some assembly. And of course, it wouldn't be an enterprise application if it wasn't there, some COBOL in there as well. Yeah, well. Um, but I'm not going to list all the components, because um, at the time of the presentation, we actually had 578 components um, that we develop on, that we maintain. And all of those have basically dependencies with each other, either directly or indirectly, and nobody knows really. Right? That's the tricky part. 
And actually, this is from when I created this presentation. So yesterday, there was already 599 components um, that we worked on. If that's not tricky enough for you, um, let's add a bit of more complexity and combine those components into three different products. Uh, three different products, which are mainly the same components, but a, a bit of a difference here, a bit of a difference there. And basically defines what components and what versions have to work together, which is actually the next keyword, versions. I mentioned three versions in maintenance. There's actually one line missing, which is the version that we develop right now. So we have like 600 components times three products times four versions. You multiply that with the databases that we support. You multiply that with all the major platforms that we run on your Linux, Windows, AIX, Solaris, HPUX, major platform. And also not so major platforms, your PS2000, your GCOS, your AS400, your 390. And yeah, who kept counting? 600 times 3 times 4 times 3 databases. Yeah, it's, it's quite a lot, actually. Um, it would be surprising if, if whenever anyone touches anything that nothing breaks. That's actually that's the easy part. <laughs> but how do, we, how do we solve this, basically? Because there's so many components. I might change something, and someone else depends on me, and I didn't even know that this component existed, and not even really what it does, right? So it's also an interesting challenge. Basically, it devise a system where not every developer needs to know all the 600 components, and we have our dependencies on um, all the dev versions. So let's do this. Uh, usually, when you try to solve a problem, you go to Stack Overflow. Now, you look like how others did it, right? Just copy paste the solution that's already out there. And especially, continuous delivery has been pretty hyped over the last couple of years and also reached uh, like the big enterprise applications and uh, the bigger companies. So I went to a couple of DevOps conferences, like the DevOps Enterprise Summit in London, and just thought, OK, there's cool companies like SAP, very comparable in, in like applications, and they do continuous delivery. Let's see how they do it. Well, it turns out not so easy, because they tend to do that and started doing continuous delivery, but all of them basically pick one component, one service, which they run themselves, which is not part of the. I forgot my oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, it's they basically pick one service, which is not on premise, which they control themselves, which basically has one technology, which one team or two teams work on, and it's only the latest version, and it's only one technology, and that's not really what I'm trying to solve. I'm trying to solve the continuous delivery part, the continuous de integration for the whole architecture that I have, for all the technologies that I have, for all the teams that are working on it at the same time. So we had to figure it out ourselves. So what we did, let's take a look. Um, well, our development hopefully looks like any other development that they are in a company. If not, please tell me. Um, we have a version control in our case kit. You can use whatever you want. And um, basically, when you get your, your tickets, you branch off, right? And all of the components that I mentioned before have their own repositories, or the majority of them. Some share the same repository, a repository if they're really close. But generally, they have, we have each um, have their own repository. So we branch off. When you're happy, you create a pull request. Some other uh, developer comes in, does a review, and you merge back. And what we have been pretty good at is verifying that our component works. Right? We have all the unit tests. We have all the um, um, migration tests. We have all the interface tests and everything. And our component does what it's supposed to do. What we don't really know is if someone else expected it to do something a bit different, and we maybe fixed a bug which caused another bug somewhere else because we don't even know that they used us. Um, and this is a bit of the tricky part. And then this is what we try to solve by every, every day, we try to verify that everything with the latest stable versions still work together with the 600 components. Uh, what, we, what you need to do then is, as we call the dependency manager, which basically knows all your components, all the different versions, all the products. And you basically rebuild your whole product suite um, on, uh, we did it uh, to begin with on a daily basis with all the latest versions of all your components uh, from the stable branches, and then you test the hell out of it. Uh, you do full stack deployments to all your different operating systems with uh, times all the different databases, um, times the different products, and then you run all the integration tests and all the smoke tests that you have for those to make sure that um, all the components still work together happily ever after. Um, and either you find some issue and hopefully you can solve it right away, or if everything looks good, we push it to a binary repository from where we can deploy it to our, at the end of every sprint. 
um, to all the systems that we can that we can control basically, right? To our internal production systems, to our IT production systems, to our field organization, to our demo systems, basically everything that we can get our hands on to test in production now, <laughs> to deploy to production as early as possible. However, still what we have is our release cycle and our customers so at the end of every release, <laughs> every time at least. At the end of the release cycle, um, we push it to our customers at the GA version. And what we want to end up with is actually moving this green box over to the blue box, right? But um, given our customer base, that might take another decade or so, but uh, I'm still working on it. Now, there's something very wrong with this picture for everyone who took a picture of it. <laughs> who can tell me what that is? I mentioned that uh, the yellow boxes, we start testing all the components with each other, right? From the stable branch, which doesn't make any sense at all. Why would I test something that's stable? It says it right on the slide, it's stable, and no need to test it. Well, because it's stable only on its own, right? The component itself is stable, but in the whole application, it might not be. So there's two choices. Either don't call it stable branch, call it potentially stable, uh, or you actually make sure that it is stable. And you do the whole testing, what I just described, before you merge something back with the whole product suite. Uh, the good news is it's very simple because you've already proven and know exactly what you need to do. It's the exact same thing with the daily, on a daily basis. You just do it more often on every branch, on every commit, on all the components. So I guess the fine print is you need a bit of hardware to do that. Um, yeah, did I mention that it's not just like one simple Java process, but like 600 components that need quite a lot of resources? So, yeah, hardware, but that's solvable. Let's take a look. There's a question. There's a question already. There's a question related to what you just presented. Uh, mm -hmm. Christopher Rauch said, how do you only build and test once a day? How do we? How do you only build and test once a day? Oh, it just comes back. OK, so this is basically in addition to everything that we had already. Building, you do as often as you can, as often as you merge, as often as you commit anything, right? Uh, you have your unit tests that run every, every time, you, uh, or your build tests that run at every build. This is basically an addition where you update your whole ecosystem with all the latest versions of all other components that have been changed during the day as well to ensure compatibility with those as well. Because when you, wanna, when you develop on, uh, on your component, you don't want to... It's the same, like, if you reach a certain size of company and components, all the, even though there's internal components, you can treat this more like third-party libraries, right? Because it's so far away. And now imagine all your third-party libraries are updated every day with their dev version, which is not released yet. And this is what you have to deal with. And this is basically what we're trying to solve, right? Um, and we started off with doing this additionally daily. And this is, as I mentioned, actually the big problem because you don't want to do it daily. You want to do it before you merge something back with the whole suite. And I'm going to go into the details now how we did that. OK. Then that will, that, I will follow on with some uh, questions after you show this. All right. So how can we do this for every branch and ideally for every commit, for every change that we push, even before we want to create a pull request? Um, first, OK, let's go through the life cycle of a change. The coding part, we didn't really touch. It's the same thing as before. No new tools, uh, nothing different. The build stuff, also the same thing can actually choose what build system they use. We actually have three different uh, types of build systems in place. Nothing really ch um, changed much there. Um, and then do you deliver your artifact that you just built from your commit on your branch to this handover endpoint. And something that we added here is this test image with the asterisk that we didn't have before. So basically, um, after doing all your build time tests and everything that you can verify there, you also generate a test image which is supposed to run uh, to verify your component in a running system. You run some test verification that your component still runs with whatever dependencies I inject in there. And it's a test image because we do it with Docker. Um, Docker is actually pretty handy to use for testing simply because the abstraction of technology. Uh, because as a team, you can basically pick and choose whatever you want. If you want to have run some JUnit-based tests in there, test in G, Selenium, Python, Java, .NET, C, I don't mind at all. And you can change your technologies in the branch as well, and test your changes on your tests as you should treat your tests just as you treat your code. Right? Um, Christopher, there's, there's actually a, a question directly related to mm -hmm. what you just shared. Was uh, follow up with Christopher Ralph was how do you handle hot fixes? 
um, like a, a treat everything like every change the same. It doesn't matter if it's if how we release it then. First, I want to solve basically every time we change something to verify that we could release it at any point in time. Because what I want to reach is every time I merge something to my stable code line to my master, that's basically a new version of my application. I basically have a new version of my application every time someone merges something, so 100 times a day. This is what I, what I want to reach, and I want to be able to have it as a release-worthy quality, basically. This is what I'm trying to solve here. And if I release it and label it as a hotfix or as a service pack or as a whatever, actually, it doesn't really concern me then. That's why you call it extreme continuous. Yeah, okay. the, the size of it. Okay. I'm going to show some numbers later. <laughs> One quick question sure. while you follow through. Is this from Markus Mitterauer. How long are your tests running, mm -hmm. and how do you orchestrate them? So how long are the tests running? Very. So I'm looking at the tests that we have right here, because we still have other tests. We have performance tests, long-running tests, and all the other things that we need to change. And then here we have basically two different sets of tests. But in generally, this test image that contains this runtime test for every component should not lo uh, run longer than two minutes. We are not there yet. Um, but this is the goal where we uh, want to achieve, because the goal at the end is when you, the time from when you do your code change, your code commit, to basically getting the full test results with the uh, whole ecosystem should not be longer than 15 minutes. This is the goal. Definitely not there, but working towards that. Because um, if you have to wait an hour, two, or four, you have already forgotten about your change anyway. And the value of that is very much diminished. So you make a change to your component on whatever branch you like. The build triggers, it hands over this artifact, and it also um, builds your tests that come, uh, go along with it um, uh, for the integration tests. And then we need to figure out what uh, context we want to test, right? what operating system, what database, what products, whatever complexity you have. And it's, we either do it for everything that we have, in if it's a merge or pull request, to verify that really everything works. And ideally, you want to do this every time. But since it costs a lot of resources to do this on every commit on every branch, we actually turn it down a bit and pick one at random if you haven't specified a very specific set that you want to do. And it's actually random asterisks because <laughs> Um, we burn our fingers a little bit because sometimes random is randomly always the same. And then you don't see the problem on the other platform. So we made it not so random anymore to catch those things before you actually do your pull request. And then the most important part, uh, make it so that any error that comes up is exactly because you changed, because of the change that you just did and not because of anything else, not because of the environment, not because of some other component that changed. Just because only the thing that you just changed. It's the whole reason why we have branches to begin with. And we basically need the same concept on the later after you build something when I want to integrate with the other components. So you start off with some stable version of your product, basically the la latest version of all the stable stuff that was deployed on all the different um, combinations. And all the tests ran through. And this is your stable baseline, basically. And then you just exchange the component which was just built from, from your branch. And this should pretty much guarantee that everything which, um, has an error now, because the tests are also the same that I verified before, um, is actually due to the line of code that you changed. And even if a test fails on some component that you haven't even heard before, uh, you can be fairly certain that it has something to do with something that you changed, uh, because it's just some dependency that you haven't been aware of. Yeah, then you know what to do, and then you just do it, basically. You deploy your... Um, Runtime test dependencies, your databases, operating systems, um, your application. Um, I can just say the system, this orchestrating system, is important that you s be gen as generic as possible and don't have anything specific to your application in there, which might sound a bit weird, but everything that's specific to your application um, is going to change eventually. And uh, when you change your application, you don't want to have to change the orchestrating system in there. right? So for example, the setup procedures and everything should just come with the components themselves, or there should be a separate installation component or the like. So everything that changes, the teams should be able to change that di directly. And then the tests. This is kind of funny, because every component has their own test image. So I, when you build, you make a change in component A, and you build component A, I not only run the test for component A, but I run the test for component B to C and 600. Right? Which basically means when I write a test, typically I write some code, I write a test, and I want to verify that the code that I wrote works and uh, protect it for anyone else that changes my component, that uh, it, it doesn't break it. 
But finally, what you really do, but this we can already do pretty well, but what I really do is I create tests to verify that if someone else changes something in some other component that I have some dependency on, they actually get notified or see if I have a dependency that they broke that they weren't aware of. It's basically, you could figure it out like, if you have third party libraries, imagine your Apache Commons, and for some reason you have to be in the latest dev build every day, and uh, you provide them the latest version of your software every day with the latest tests, and before they commit a change in their Apache Commons, they actually verify that they don't break anything with your latest dev version. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> and that's basically what we do here, because like, at a certain size, it's almost like third party components. Yeah, and of course, there's a lot of uh, things that you also need to figure out and a lot of challenges, um, but I think each of those were a separate talk. So um, if you have questions later on, um, I will be available to discuss those. But for now, everybody loves numbers, right? Let's talk some numbers. This um, system, like I described it for uh, every feature bunch for every commit that we do, has gone live actually only recently, only like six, seven weeks ago. And since then, um, every day now, we do about 300 full stack deployments, operating systems, databases, everything in the network. We, just for testing purpose, we create uh, about half a terabyte of just product bundles uh, to verify. And we run uh, over 1,200 test containers um, every day, which can have multiple test suites, which can have multiple test cases. And uh, yeah, we run it on hosts which have 256 gigs of RAM, 56 cores each. Actually, we run it on two. I only have four because uh, another two are being installed right now. Pretty cool what you can get for money already. <laughs> now, the interesting part is that this system is active for 26 components out of the 600 that I mentioned before. So these numbers are only for the 26 components, which basically boils down to the 4.3% of the components which I guess is the reason why my colleague mentioned that I should call this talk Extreme Continuous, Delivery, uh, continuous Integration. Yeah, pretty extreme, huh? <laughs> to be fair though, um, a grain of salt, those 26 components are the ones with the high volume changes. So uh, the number of changes that we have in there is probably like 40, 50%. So in reality, like the numbers are maybe gonna double, triple, and not times 25. Uh, at least that's my expectation. At, at least that's what I tell my boss when I order no hardware. <laughs> yeah, I like this. Who loves word art? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, five minutes left. Challenges. I'm actually going to skip through most of the challenges and summarize it in mostly the challenges as they tend to always be are less the technical ones. It's not so much about the software or technical problems. It's more about mindsets, cultures, and basically changing the way that you work and the ideas that you have in your head. Um, and yeah, effective test automation is maybe something that I want to put out. You can have like thousands of tests uh, which actually don't have any value. You can have 10,000 of tests and five ones are flaky. So just random five ones always fail, so you basically have zero value. I'd rather throw away every test that doesn't have any value, throw away any test that doesn't, that, that has like 50-50 chance of success because of some other stuff, uh, and just boil it down to a few simple tests which actually tell me something, and have less, ma less maintenance for that, and basically do effective testing and not like uh, quantitative much testing. Right? But that's really tricky where you draw the line, what you really want to do, how much time can you, well, is 15 minutes too short, is it too long? Like these kinds of things to figure that out is a bit tricky. And as always, small steps end to end. Don't do everything at once, start with one component, start with one application, start with one operating system, and just go on from there. Okay, since uh, I think I'm running out of time, two, three minutes left, I've uh, got to turn add mode on. Uh, real quick and say that our products are great because we do continuous delivery, we do continuous deployment, and of course we do it with our products, with atomic products, because like the whole orchestration, maybe to the question before, is done basically with our automation solution, where you integrate with all the different technologies. So with that, I want to say thank you. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Christopher. <laughs> Thanks. First of all. Yeah. I want to apologize. I was taking this extreme, continuous to the extreme with extreme Q&A moderation. I will 
calm it down. I apologize. No, it's kind of fun. Like you're asking me questions, and they're coming up, and they're directly related to the context of what you're saying, and this kind of mind meld thing. It's asking intimate. Alex, Alexander, I'm calming down. So no more extreme continuous moderation. Other questions. There is uh, Thomas. I can't pronounce last name. What do you think of using GitLab runner for CI except Jenkins and others? Except Jenkins and others? Yes. I, what do you think of using? So um, there's a lot of different tools that you can do this with, right? Um, a lot of people try to do it with Jenkins, which actually works, works quite well. In our case, Jenkins wouldn't work because just the, sh the size that we have, the scale that we have, and mainly also the platforms um, that we run on. Um, you might have also seen like three different build systems, like Team City, Jenkins, and our own solution, simply because it's hard to find a build system that runs on all the mainframes as well and all these kinds of things, right? Um, there's like the Travis uh, stuff, which actually works wonders. I uh, really like it. We have a bit of a different approach because we differentiate between everything that's built and then the integration runtime tests, which Travis and all the other tools basically combine this into the build step which is then a bit tricky because you need another layer on top, right? Because one thing is building your component, and then on top of that, you build your whole product, which contains another hundred, a couple hundred components. So there was just this layer missing in between. Um, depending on your application, uh, with the software, you pick the right tool for you. There's a lot of different tools for different contexts um, that you can use. Yeah. So all of them are good tools for the right context. Simon uh, Schatka had asked how much of a bit of hardware are you talking about? A bit of hardware. And how do you use mm -hmm. cloud in-house? So um, first of all, I thought this was a perfect cloud scenario, because you only need the resources when you do changes. You only do changes when you work. So like Monday to Friday, hopefully only Monday to Friday and during the day. So it's only like a third of the week, right? which would be a good use case for cloud, because you don't need the resources as much. Um, however, uh, this doesn't, uh, didn't work out as good because of the different continents, the different time zones. We already have like a bigger span over the day. Um, we have also have some insane people that work on the, on the weekends as well. And uh, the thing is, we, I did the calculations like for the base resources. Uh, it's just way too expensive actually uh, in the cloud stuff. Uh, it's actually more expensive than you think. And like those plates, they're surprisingly cheap, what you can get actually for a little less, uh, for not so much money. Um, however, we're still looking at it for like burst outs. To have a, a certain like base load that we can cover in house, and then for burst out, go into some cloud stuff that we can cover that. Last question, and I apologize if I don't have all questions here, but this can be answered later uh, in line. Um, how do you maintain test data and configuration? This is from Phil Potisk. Mm -hmm. How do you maintain a test data? Um, so the test, what's very important is that the tests are basically self-contained. So the test itself um, has all the test data that it needs. It has basically all the preparation, all the data uh, down within the test. And it's very important that it can just grab this and run it on any system. Right? It shouldn't be my specific test system. I should basically be able to connect it to any customer environment and run this test. Um, one of the tricky things is also you have to create tests that generate the data themselves within the test definition and run simultaneously with another 100 tests. So don't generate test user objects that's called tests, because that's going to break someone. Right? Um, so this is a bit tricky, but everything contained within the test. Good. Yeah. At the configuration management, we have this like, dependency manager that I said, which basically knows all components, all versions, the repositories where they come from, and which merges everything together. Christopher from Atomic? Yes. You're based here in Vienna? I'm from or? Vienna, yeah. Born and raised. So wonderful. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Yeah, Another thanks applause for having Christopher me. Hale from Atomic. It's awesome. a good talk. Super. Yeah, and if you, you have questions, I'm going to be, we have a booth here actually. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be at the booth the next hour. Just come by.